In some ways, Seven Languages in Seven Weeks is an outlandish title for a book. And yet, I'm about to come in here and talk about seven languages in seven hours, right? Even one hour, right? So um, it's, it's actually an outrageous premise for a talk. And I'm not going to pretend to cover like patterns in any of the languages. What I wanted to do is capture a little bit of the character of each language. And that's one of the problems that I had when, when I started writing the book. And the scariest part about the book is when you end one chapter and you start the next. And you have to quickly flip somebody's mental, uh, mental picture as you're turning the page with you. And my editors and I threw away about seven or eight introductions and, and endings before we landed on an approach. And that approach was, it's a little bit trite, but I think it's interesting. We compared each language to a movie character. And that's how you get seven languages at the cinema. So the seven languages in the book in the order that I cover them are Ruby, and that's still the language that I use in my practice today. I use it because it gives me um, better leverage for the types of programs that I solve than anything else on the list. Though we're starting to look at some of these other languages for some of the problems around the corners, like Erlang and Clojure. IO, which is um, a language that was invented by a guy named Steve DeCorte, if you haven't seen one of the languages on this list, that's probably the one that you haven't seen. It's probably not going to be commercially successful, but it's also one of the best examples of a prototype language at its most primitive form. It's, it's an excellent language, and, and for a while it looked like this was going to be um, a language that would really pop, especially in um, mobile applications. Then um, there's also Prolog, and that's the, the language on this list that gave me the most problems in the first write of a chapter. There's Scala, that's kind of a bridge between the object-oriented and functional worlds. Erlang, a language that's built for massive concurrency and distributed systems and failover. Then there's Clojure, that's, that's Lisp meets Java. And there's the, the Haskell programming language. And this was the hardest sub part of a chapter that I had to write. It was in, for a concept called, called monads in, in Haskell. And so one of the things that I'd like to point out very early in this talk is that it's an important time to be at a conference like this one. And it's an important time to not read this book, but read other articles about languages that you don't know. Because every 20 years like clockwork, programming paradigms change. We had um, machine, the machine paradigm, and then um, to higher level languages, to procedural languages, to object-oriented languages. And every time that we have a new programming paradigm, it's enough for a long time. But those programs run out of gas, and we were talking about that just yesterday. And when they run out of gas, there's usually something that drives that. And right now, the thing that seems to be driving that is the, um, the evolution of, of the microprocessor, right? We've run out of space on a chip. We have to stack them now. We're going for parallel designs, right? So now, all of our laptops are probably at least dual core, some of them more. And the languages are not keeping up. The object-oriented language paradigm, the family of languages that most of us have kind of grown up with, is no longer adequate. So it's not an accident that four of the languages in this book are functional languages. They're better suited for the types of problems that we're going to solve. I'm not saying that any of these are going to be the next big thing, but it's an important time to take your eyes and pick them up a little bit. OK, so here's an example of what we're going to do throughout the talk. We're going to go through these languages, not in the order that they're listed in the book, but in chronological order. And then we'll talk about some of the other things that were going on at the same time that maybe inspired or drove the design of a language. Got that? So what movie is this? Rain Man, has anybody ever coded Prologue? Do you like the comparison? So, so sometimes this guy, you look at him and you say, how did he know that, right? Sally Dibbs, and then he rattles off the name of the, of, of the girl, you know, because he read the phone book last night. And then there are times that you look at him and you say, how didn't he know that, right? As, as I was writing the book, one of the things that I tried to do was get some notes from the inventor of the language. This was the only person, or the only language whose inventor I didn't interview for the book. 
But the person that I did talk to was a guy who, who um, did a show on Nova. And that show was about dolphins. And he used Prologue to model the behavior of the dolphins. And it's, it's actually a pretty cool story. They were trying to find why this dolphin, this stupid dolphin, couldn't get a, a, an abstract con concept. So they would point to things in the tank um, and they would say, you know, ball. And then the dolphin would swim to the ball. And then they would say hoop, and the dolphin would swim through the hoop. And then they got abstract concepts like through hoop, and the dolphin would jump through the hoop, around the hoop, the dolphin would go around the hoop. But there was a, um, there was a, a command that the dolphin couldn't get. And it was not, the concept of not. Every time they would say not ball, and there were two, only two things in the tank, right? There's a ball and you know maybe some other toy like a hoop. The dolphin would just stay at the window. He would say, not ball. And the dolphin would stay at the window. Well, the prologue program, after they programmed these behaviors, um, the, the prologue, the, he, as they were coding the thing, well, it, it said, what are the things that are not ball? And one of them was window, because one of the commands was come to the window and pose for a picture. So the dolphin's answer to not ball was window. Right, it's pretty cool. So um, that's so. Prologue struck me as as Rain Man because sometimes it was hard to figure out how the Prologue knew it. But also, when you code Prologue for the first time and you come from an object-oriented background like I did, there are some things that should be really simple that are hard to do, like um, variable assignments. You, you can assign a variable a value one time. And um, it, it makes you rethink the way that you attack programs. So um, shout these out as you know them. If you were, at the same time, if you were programming um, something that needed performance, you would use, right? So C-3PO is a Star Wars character, does translation. He doesn't fight. He doesn't add intelligence. You spit out one, one line, he spits out the same, the same line in another, in another platform, right? So that's how this works. So if you were writing applications for business, you would use, come on, shout them out. What's that? COBOL, COBOL right. So what's going to be around longer, Rocky or COBOL? I don't think any, any of us knows the answer to that one. If you were doing um, f formulas or, or scientific computing, Fortran, right? And who is this? Yeah, yeah. So see if you guys can complete the sentence. If my calculations are correct. When this baby hits 88 miles an hour, you're going to see some serious. <laughs> Eight, okay. Eight, when, when, this, when this baby hits 88 miles an hour, you're going to see some serious. Um, then the next word was smudge. Um, okay, so back to Prologue. Prologue was, was created around 1970 or so. This was a language that grew up in, in the I.O. tradition of programs. And um, it, it served as an inspiration to a lot of other languages. And it's, so if, if you really want to jumpstart a programming career, you can jump on to constraint-based logic programming. There's a family of languages that are kind of quiet, but when they're used, they're, they're really in high demand. Because this is how, for example, air traffic control is done, a lot of logistics are done. Um, constraint-based logic programming, that's, that's kind of the family that, um, that Prolog jumpstarted. This is hello world. So basically, I have some symbol on the left hand side. You might, you, um, this is a rule. You might pass parameters to it. And then there's some kind of implication, right? So hello is true if everything over here on, on the right hand side is true. And this just um, prints out some stuff. And we'll have hello world in, in I don't know, 30 languages or so today. Um, one of the things that was interesting as I was learning Prolog was that when I landed on the right programming problem, things got really easier. So when I learned Ruby, I, I was really big into Sudokus. Who, who flips over to the Sudoku page of the paper in the morning and loves to work those things? Well, now we all have them on the iPhones, right? But you know, back then it was a newspaper. Um, and I learned to solve a, a Sudoku problem in Ruby. And one of the things that had to happen, um, since Ruby was a little bit slow, 
was I had to first learn to fill out the board and then, um, then I had to learn to procedurally do all these different kinds of transformations, right? Like um, if, there was the, if the same number appears twice in a row, well, that's illegal, go on to the next number. And there are a number of other different techniques and transformations that you could do. But when I solved this problem in Prolog, instead of this, this problem taking two weeks to get the basics and then another two weeks to get the harder transformations, it took me about four hours to solve the whole problem because all I had to do was describe the rules of the game. That's what the right language feels like. So this is the prologue program to solve a pseudocode. So this says that an empty list is valid, and I've got this, this set of rules called valid that's going to take a list of rows, columns, or squares. Right? So a pseudocode board is 9 by 9, has um, 9 rows, 9 columns, and then 9 3 by 3 squares. And the list is valid. It's broken into head and tail. If everything in the head is different and the tail is valid, so this is a recursive call. And there's a mapping so that all the cells in the pseudoku are present. There's 81 of these. And then there's a board. So that's basically my API. That thing is, is going to evaluate to true if all of this stuff is true. If there's if the board is equal to all the things in the list, right? So now I'm relating this piece and this piece together, saying that this is a list that forms that. And then if everything in the board is a digit from one to nine, if these are the rows, these are the columns, and these are the squares. Now granted, this isn't super elegant, but give me a break, it was my first prologue program and the rows are valid, and the columns are valid, and the squares are valid, and I am done. I have described the rules of the game, and that's the prologue program. That's the difference. It's like, it's like marriage. You know, there's always a swipe that you're looking for that, that tells you the job to do, but the real wife tells you how to do the job. Take out the trash, take the front door, not the back door, so you don't leave the, you know, blah, 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 right? So, so this is the, the program, and this is how you use the API, right? So these are wildcards. This means look for something that will fit. So Prolog is going to say, okay, I'm going to take this, and I'm going to tell you whether that's true or false, and I'm going to plug in values, and partially using that domain statement that plugs in from 1 to 9, and I'm going to work through values until I find one that works. All that iteration through the possible solutions is built in. And there's some sophisticated backtracking and things that make it all hang together. And um, when you type this in, that's what you get. And this is much, much, much faster than, than my Ruby solution was. OK, that's all I have about Prolog. Now, one of the interesting things about Prolog for me was that the person that I, I had targeted to write the foreword of the book was the author of the Erlang language, Joe Armstrong. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but he based the earliest implementation of Erlang on Prolog. So I came to him asking him about, what do you think of this book? Um, or would you write a foreword for me? He says, well, first I need to see the book. And then the notes that came back are, um, I get the sense that the author understands Erlang reasonably well. I do not get the same sense that the author understands Prolog. <laughs> and then he took me under his wing and he helped me make the chapter better. But so the next language is Erlang. Now, syntax, some languages have a beautiful, beautiful syntax. Erlang is not one of those languages. <laughs> Now, I understand that this is a subjective thing. If you grew up with influences, um, if, if you grew up worshiping the prologue language and based your syntax on a prologue experience, then your sense of aesthetics might be similar to Joe's. But most of you probably um, grew up in, in the same environment. These are some of the things that were going on at the same time. What language is this? 
Yes. And I intentionally use the Muppets because there's a closet population of adults that love the Muppets. <laughs> you never at a conference ask how many of you like the basic language because you'll never see a hand that goes up, right? But if you ask the same question, how many of you that have a brother or a sister that likes the basic language? Everybody, you know, <laughs> the hand immediately shoots up. Um, I think that basic is a very intelligent, um, it, it's almost a, a, a closet, a closet sleeper of a language. It, it was a language that's very good at what it does at, at teaching the concepts. And the environments in, in basic are very well put together for the most part. On the other hand, there's a close cousin. What's this? Visual basic. Visual basic. Very easy to get started on that trip, right? You can get started down that road. <laughs> And then the old wheels come off the family truckster. <laughs> this was going on at about the same time. There's another language that's, that's not Forrest Gump. He's not super intelligent, but he is wise. What language is this? Pascal, Pascal is another language that's wise. Not just because of the notes that are played. You know, you think B.B. King on the guitar. What makes him great? Is it because he can throw so many notes at you? Well, no, it's actually the flavor of the notes and the things that he doesn't play. So the taste of this language, what's included and what's left out, also makes it a very effective language for shaping um, reasonably um, pretty programs in for the time. Pascal is another wise language. Now, these weren't big influences on Joe Armstrong. This is another language that was not an influence on Joe Armstrong. What's that? Anybody read that? The bottom says transcript show. Do you know what this is? Small talk, yes. It's amazing to me that everybody in the academic community was on this bandwagon hard. What's that? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Transcript show, yes, yes, you're right. Transcript show, yeah, you're right, that's a parameter. Uh, colon, a good catch. <laughs> hey, he's, he's the first person that's ever paid attention to the, all the hello worlds. Maybe you can debug all my hello worlds. Okay, but I find it amazing that Dr. Armstrong wasn't that interested in this road that everybody else was, was traveling pretty well. And the reason was that Object-oriented languages depend on mutability. You have to be able to reassign variable values for the most part, at least at this time, to make an efficient object-oriented program. And Dr. Armstrong said that idea is poison. So the things that were impacting him were, what's this one? Again, we've seen it before. Fortran and Prolog. All right, those were the big influences that led us to Erlang. And Erlang was actually built to solve some of the most difficult concurrency problems and availability problems in the world, phone switches. This was a business that was absolutely exploding. They knew that it was gonna get even bigger with, um, with wireless technologies, and they were looking for a solution. And they couldn't find the right language to solve the problem, so they eventually settled on Erlang. This is Hello World in Erlang, and you can kind of see some of the prologue, um, what, inspiration with the implication here. That's not really unification, which is how prologue works, but you can see it does have some matching um, built in here, but um, in this case, we're, we're, we've got a library called Erlang, and we're going to display the message. So one of the things that I noticed about Erlang was that, so if, let, me, let me ask instead a question. If you were to, to say, I want to build a 100% reliable program, what typing model would you expect that to be? Statically, Statically typed, right? Let the compiler catch my mistakes, right? That's not the approach that Joe Armstrong took. His approach was let it crash, know when it crashes, and start another one, right? And so where our exception logic sometimes makes up 
60, 70 percent of our application, more if you're doing old school Java and, and running all those exceptions. Erlang programs have very little of this type of logic because when something wants to go astray, they let it die and they start another one. They build those capabilities into the libraries and into the virtual machine called the Beam. So let's build an application that's going to crash. This is Russian roulette. <laughs> so to me, so this guy believed that object-oriented programming was poison. But this is organized a lot like an object-oriented program. When you type a three, do this thing. When you type anything else, do this thing, right? So you're supposed to enter a number from one to six. That looks like the original message passing. That's because this thing is going to be run in a different process. And you say, wait a minute, Bruce. What if I have thousands and thousands of, of processes in my Erlang application? I would say that Erlang applications do. Starting a process is very, very lightweight, and it changes the way that you think about building a functional program. Concurrency is now your friend. We don't have the same sets of problems that object-oriented problem, um, programs had. And that's why um, some of the decisions that are made in Erlang um, look this way. So anyway, I have this, this outer loop. Then I, have, I say, receive a message. Basically, when you send a message to an Erlang process, it, that message goes on to a queue, and then you can pull those off of a queue and, and execute them one at a time. This is called the actor pattern, and it's actually the central concurrency strategy, and not just Erlang, but also um, two other languages that we're going to see, Scala and I.O. This isn't the cool part, though. This is the cool part. So here, I've got another loop. Right? That means that there's, this is going to run in another process, so I'm going to spawn off a thread. And if I get the new message, I'm going to display creating a new process, and then I register something at the symbol revolver, and then I spawn a function. That's, that's my Russian roulette um, program that you saw before. So that gives me a new one, associates it with um, a regi registered dictionary um, in the name revolver. And then I'm going to loop. And then if I get a message that looks like this tuple that has exit and then some process ID and some reason code, uh, I could say restarting the dead shooter and then send the message to new. I send a message, a distributed message to another process just like I, I pass an object-oriented message. So you can see that this is pure functional programming. Well, not, not pure functional programming. You can see that this is, is functional programming with a lot of the same paradigms, but it protects you against, against some, of the, some of the problems that, that you can see in other object-oriented languages. OK. The next language in our chronological tour is Haskell. And some of, the, some of you uh, immediately get the joke. Um, Spock is, is purely logical, and hard things are really easy for Spock. And easy things like laughing, I don't know, printing your name, are really hard. <laughs> so this, you guys won't get this one. There's, there's really no clue here. So this is one of the lazy languages, you have a chance, Dan. One of the lazy languages that Haskell is based on. Miranda, yes! Who said that? I wish I had a t-shirt. <laughs> You'll be the first. Okay, and, and so some of the things that were going on at the same time, um, small talk, and, and this, this community didn't pick up small talk much for the same reason that Joe Armstrong didn't. Erlang was being created kind of at the same time that Haskell was created. The difference is that Erlang was created at a corporation with, with really one person driving the vision. How was Haskell created? Does anybody know? Committee. In a committee. And some of you are kind of going, ooh, <laughs> a committee. I'm Presbyterian. I know what that means. <laughs> I am Presbyterian, by the way. Um, but yeah, this is the only successful language that I found um, out of all the ones I've looked at for, for uh, you know, this, this book or the, the languages that were, um, I, I studied 
in preparation of the book, this was the only successful language that has, that's really a beautiful language that was created in a committee. What's that? Ada? Are you kidding me or no? I'm kidding. Okay, okay. Oh, man. I was going to throw down there. I think Ola could kick my butt, though. Um, and so if you're doing the high performance application, at this point you're doing, and we have to do a hat tip to the original Hello World, that is kind of the father of all the Hello World applications here. And in Haskell, well, I guess you can um, like print a value or, um, or save a value or all those things are hard and they require me to get into um, like programming philosophy and theory of something called the monad. And I really, really don't want to go there. Um, but anyway, this is a Haskell function that returns the value um, fascinating and, and um, You're probably right. That's two bugs. <laughs> Excellent. Six times and all right. I've got to find you guys t-shirts, so give me your emails. Okay, so the two things I want to say about um, Haskell or that I want to point out are, are first, this is um, an example of a lazy language and, and it really makes certain things easy to do. This is an example of a, a infinite Fibonacci series, and we're going to basically start it at 1-1, one, one, and, um, and then, so I have three functions. The first one says, the Fibonacci series of x and y is uh, made up of the value x concatenated with the value of lazy fib of y and x plus y. That looks almost exactly like the mathematical definition, and that's why Haskell is a beautiful thing. You think, well, wait a minute, that's, that's infinite. Well, yes, it is. But you use this, this infinite function um, and delay the execution and just pick up the pieces you need. For example, I'm going to chop off the whole front end of this function by saying the, um, the Fibonacci sequence is the lazy Fib sequence that started at 1 and 1, right? So now I say the first two numbers are 1 and 1. And then I'm going to use that still. Um, not terminated, I'm going to terminate it by saying give me the nth Fibonacci sequence by taking the head and then dropping x minus 1 and then um, taking the, the value. Right? Wait. You drop x and then you take x. Drop x minus 1, yeah, so I drop x minus 1, so I, I take x, right, so if there are if they're 500, I'm going to take 500 and I'm going to drop the first 499. That's basically how it works. Okay? And this is the second piece I want to point out about Haskell. I think that there's a misnomer that, um, that some language zealots get into that static typing is always a bad thing. I think that um, bad, status, bad static typing is a bad thing and, and object-oriented static typing almost always gets in the way. It makes things uh, much more demanding. Um, and then you, know, you, you can debate whether, those extra, whether the extra effort is worth it or not. I'm not going to get into that debate. But often in functional languages, a good static type system is a very beautiful thing. So one of the things that I noticed with, with ha the Haskell language was that often even complicated programs work the first time. And the reason was that I was able to reason through those based on the type system. So here, I'm just going to give you a flavor of it. The first thing that I'm doing is I'm saying, OK, there's, there's, a, there's a, a data type called suit. And that's made up of spades, hearts, diamonds, and clubs. And then there's a rank that's made of 10 through ace. And then there's a card that has a rank and a suit, and a deck that's a list of cards, and a hand that's also a list of cards. Right? So now when I start to use these things, I can say, okay, well, when I shuffle something, I want to pass in a deck, and it's going to return a deck that's shuffled up. Or, and then, then I follow that with an implementation, or when I deal, that's going to take the number of um, hands to deal and the number of um, cards in each hand, 
and that's going to return a hint. Now, this might look a little bit crazy to you. What's happening here is that these are the first two um, parameters in the list, right? So deal is going to take a hand, the number of hands, and the size of each hand, and then it's going to use a technique called, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it would. Um, I'm just trying not to go down that road. <laughs> trying to simplify a little bit here. But um, so basically, um, basically what's happening here is I'm taking a technique called partially applied functions to carve one function with multiple parameters into a chain of functions. And that makes the language very re easy to reason about academically. Right? And <laughs> The side effect of that is that we get a whole bunch of nice behaviors um, from the type system in Haskell. Yeah? I'm just going to jump on this really quickly. So yeah. the, the main motivation in my mind for partially applied functions yep. in general is compo composability, not necessarily you know, formal reasoning. It's right. The composition is really where it's at. Yeah, so Dan is, what Dan is saying is that now, rather than, rather than having to deal with this complex structure um, of um, of you know, the, the deal function, um, I can break that into um, a series of smaller functions and compose those together. And so we're, we're kind of saying the same things. Um, and and by, by that composability, I can, so now the basic building block of a functional programmer is the type system plus the, plus the composition of functions. And you can take even complicated functions with complicated types and parameter lists and break those down into a composed chain of functions, right? And then you can reason about how to move those around and, um, and that's, that's your stepping stone for refactoring in the functional world. Okay. And I think that that's about as deep as we can go into Haskell without my, my brain exploding. Especially with these guys in the room, I'm, I'm in trouble. Okay. Now let's, um, let's talk about the, I don't know, the, the savior of your universe or your great Satan, depending on your perspective. I think that there's a lot of passion about Ruby in one direction or another. I think that um, we had this discussion over lunch yesterday and um, you know, I, didn't, I didn't jump in in the middle and I kind of felt like I was, I was stabbing my friend Matt's in the back here. But um, it was fun to listen to the ideas that, that people were, um, that, that it's fun to, fun to listen to the idea that there was a lot of passion around this language. And I think that it comes from, um, from the Ruby side, the idea that this, this is, that this is a fun language. Um, and we'll get into that in a second. Um, and there's a lot of passion against Ruby on the other side and that this really isn't built or motivated to be um, an enterprise language for, from the inside out. So it makes, you know, some of the hard things in, um, in the enterprise are especially hard with Ruby. But, um, so some of the things that were going on at the same time were this language, what's that? And this one, there's one way to do something and it's the right way. Yeah. Python. Python, yes, yes, yes. Who said Perl? Iceman for Perl? <laughs> Come on, no, this is Pearl. <laughs> right? The world's only right, only language. So this is obviously Hello World and Ruby. <laughs> Ruby made DSLs and metaprogramming accessible to the Joe programmer. And what that means in, in my practice is that I'm building with larger building blocks and my code is easier for me to maintain. Um, and I like that. Um, there are a lot of languages in this stack that are equally good at metaprogramming, but this is kind of where I found it the first time. So you know, one of the examples of metaprogramming that I like is a state machine. So these are actually on the level of a method definition in the class, if you can picture that, rather than within a method. But this class acts as a state machine, it has an initial state of processing, 
it has states of processing and accepted, and the accept event transitions from processing to um, accepted. This is a little DSL that when you execute it, it creates all the methods and um, instance variables that you need to actually run a state machine with this particular class. Like for example, I could say, um, I could say accept exclamation point and that will fire the accept event and it will make this transition in the state machine. But I think that this is kind of the passion that Matz was going for when he created the language in the first place. When you say that um, Ruby is not performant and you tell that to Matz to his face, he said, I know, I wasn't going for that. I was going for fun. So what he's really saying is that he's optimizing this language for the programmer and he's going to let the computer do the rest of the work. And for a, a certain class of applications, this optimization is very effective. Okay, stop. <laughs> What's it going to be? What's Scala going to be? Yeah. So this is actually one of my favorite movie characters, my favorite movie roles of all time. This is a beautiful creature, Edward and Edward Scissorhands, played by Johnny Depp. Uh, I just love it. He's this monstrosity that's kind of caught between two worlds. <laughs> and he has these cuts on his, he has this, this, these cuts on his face not because of the scissors on his hands, but because of the blog arguments back and forth between, you know, the, the object-oriented guys and the functional guys. <laughs> and these are the things that were, so we're kind of marrying these worlds. This is Pascal or functional programming and Java. Java. <laughs> okay, 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 I'm equal opportunity. Java's evil, Java's evil twin. Yeah. C sharp, right? <laughs> That's bad. It gets worse. I have a demo, ready? Oh, I'm sorry. That's really bad. <laughs> my apologies. My apologies. Okay. Hello. What's this one? It's Ada. Ah. So um, it is a bridge language, right? So we talked about the idea that programming paradigms change. And they change every 20 years or so, and they change so slowly because we're not looking for a new language. We're, we've got new problems that the old languages are no longer equipped to solve. And it doesn't happen overnight. It, it happens, it takes a while for this to gather momentum. And when you make the transition, it doesn't happen with one language that suddenly explodes on the scene. Think about how we got from procedural programming, which was C and Pascal and, and COBOL and, and Fortran and, and that family of languages. Think, think of how we got there from there to Java. We first had the initial exploration that was sort of almost commercially successful in object-oriented programming. And what was that? Small talk, right? And then we had a bridge language that said, hey, there are some object-oriented concepts that make sense. Ada. Right? C++ is another one. Who said C++? Um, yeah, excellent. That's another bridge language. That's, that's its, its role in the universe. And so, you know, Buzz Lightyear with the wings, I can fly, sort of. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's like C++, because did we really write truly object-oriented programs in C++? Not for the most part, right? It was like a C++ minus minus, right? <laughs> But then, when the time was right, Java popped, right? That's what's going to happen this time, right? And so we have Scala, and I think that Scala is actually, it's, it, it's almost brilliant because some of the problems that Scala had to solve are nearly insurmountable. How do you build a type system that works, a, a strong static type system that works across an object-oriented language that has a lot of, of typing idiosyncrasies and a functional language that, um, that is also strongly typed that isn't necessarily compatible with the Java typing system. And then you have to layer that onto a JVM or 
you know, the CLR, which is the Microsoft version of, of the JVM, which has its own typing biases. So it's actually brilliant work that's going to you know, step us closer to an end game of a beautiful functional language that'll, that'll work for us. So this is a hello world in, in Scala. Um, you can make this more complicated. You can make it simpler. Um, this, is, this is kind of where I've decided to draw the line. And where you come from really has, has a lot to do with how you view the Scala language. If you come from a Java background, um, maybe it can feel like some shackles are being thrown off. And I have this type inference that's really beautiful. And you can really write a, a smaller, more beautiful Java. You can also be exposed to, to, some, um, to some programming concepts like closures and currying and partially applied functions that, that we Java developers didn't have access to. Um, and, and actually, whole frameworks grew up, around, grew up around the idea that we didn't have access to these, these ideas. But if you came from somewhere else, maybe a, um, a dynamically typed world, instead of giving, giving these wonderful new tools that let you, you know, shape the, your universe, maybe you, you feel like you, you're, you're more constrained than you need to be. Maybe you feel um, like all this stuff is dangerous and I don't understand this world and how to use it. So your perspective really changes based on where you've come from. Okay, so inevitably somebody asked me what was the, the, your favorite interview for the book. And without a doubt, this was the, um, the creator of IO, Steve DeCorte. He was uh, just, just a wonderful man. Um, and it's, it's a relatively small community, but I kind of picked my way through and, and talked to people until, until I got an introduction. And then, um, and then I had a new Mac, and, and, um, his, and, and then I.O. wouldn't install. And so the creator of the language helped me you know, get, get my compiler stack straight. And it was really embarrassing, actually. But, but through that process, I got to know, the, know um, Steve a little bit. And he has wonderful taste um, in, in languages and, and what to include and what not to include. This is I.O. So I.O. is a prototype language. It it's, was created in about um, 2003. I say about, because it's because um, I.O. was a hobby language that was um, where, where Steve was basically looking for techniques. And, um, and you know, he was lo he's looking to get into the idea of how to create a language and um, what some of the trade-offs are. And um, he, he, <clears throat> he made some great decisions along the way. The first one is that it's a prototype language. That means it's, it's kind of a subset of object-oriented programming, though not really. Um, it's a superset. It's a superset. Um, so JavaScript is also a prototype language. Um, it's also a, a, a strong message, message passing language. And um, it gets a lot of the ideas about concurrency right. It has um, a, lot of, a lot of strong opinions about the value of a simple, clean syntax, much like Lisp does. In fact, I think that I would probably say the closest analog, you know, if I were to, to describe I.O. In, in one sentence, it would be, this is the Lisp of the, of the prototype world. So the syntax is prototype, message with arguments, and that's going to return another prototype so you can chain them together, or a prototype, an operator, and another prototype. Right? That's it. That's, that's all you have to know about syntax. The rest is in the libraries. There's very, very little syntactic sugar in the language. So this is pretty cool and just disturbing. You know? <laughs> this is kind of the Ferris Bueller aspect. You know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. In this case, I've got a, uh, I've got a string. If it's nil, I want to say whoever called this method go back and modify that object, right? Whoever called me, <laughs> go back, which should be hidden, right? <laughs> go back and modify them, you know, maybe by cleaning up the nil. So that is simultaneously so right and so wrong, I can't begin to describe it. <laughs> What's that? Good catch. 
wow, they're paying attention. This is awesome. So it isn't looking like I.O. is going to make it. And there are a lot of reasons for this. One is the explosion of JavaScript, which is kind of in a, completing, in a competing place. But there are some things that I.O. did that are very, very good. The concurrency libraries are absolutely beautiful. And when you look at the, the performance of non-concurrent I.O. code, um, and, then, and then you solve the same and equivalent problems with, with a concurrent implementation of the code, you really get that idea. It has a very simple, clean syntax, and it also has the ability to do some meta programming. I showed you that there was an operator. Well, that operator table is 100% available for you to override, as are any of the um, operations on, on any of the um, objects in the system. So that makes metaprogramming very easy, not just from the perspective of I can change behaviors based on, um, based on the contents of, of um, my object, but I can also change the syntax and make it evolve the way that I want to. And it has a very small footprint. So when I talked to Steve, one of the funnest questions were, have you ever seen this, this in, um, in production in, in a place that surprised you? And he said, yeah, there are tons of them. And then he told me about um, I.O. and a satellite. You know, maybe I want one of those metal, metal pointy hats, right? If, if you did that object nil thing. Um, and it was in, in Pixar and some, some places like that. And I said, well, yeah, those are, those are places where they're looking for an embedded, scriptable environment. And, and I.O. Is, is a fantastic choice for things like that. OK. Now we get a little bit controversial. So I really like this character for, um, for Lisp because, for a flavor of Lisp, because Yoda is in exile, right? <laughs> Lisp has been in exile for, what, 40, 50 years. And we keep coming back to Lisp because there's some, something worth coming back to. But something always prevents Lisp from getting, getting over the edge, right? But I love the metaphor that this is based on a language that's in exile. And this is really the marriage of two other um, languages, <laughs> Java and Lisp, right? But when you talk about Lisp, you have to say which Lisp. Are you talking about common Lisp or Scheme <laughs> or Spice Lisp or Mac Lisp or Stanford Lisp or Dr. Scheme? <laughs> That one's Microsoft. <laughs> I'm, starting to, I'm starting to see the problem here, right? So one of the things about Lisp that's cool has also been a little bit of its downfall. Um, you can basically whip out a new dialect of Lisp in a heartbeat. Is that a good thing? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> So this is what Hello World looks like in Closure or Lisp. One of the things that I noticed about this language was that um, some of the things that have been sacred to Lisp developers aren't necessarily sacred to the creator of Closure, which is Rich Hickey. And, um, If you think about the, the, the core of Lisp, you always think parents, right? Everything is in, in parents. But even that's not sacred. So this is uh, an example of, of defining a um, variable called board. And then that's basically a list of lists. So what's, what game is that? Tic-tac-toe, obviously, right? So maybe I want to be able to do something like pick out the center, center there. Um, Lisp is great at, at slicing through data very, very quickly. Even in the parameter list, even in the argument list here. So maybe I wanted to find a function called center that takes a board and then I, I built some implementation to find the middle square because maybe I want to always go for the middle, right? So this is what that looks like in closure. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to fix that for you right now. 
Stop the madness, right? Okay, there you go. You guys want to go back and fix the other ones too? <laughs> no typo. Nice job, man. Um, okay, so there's there's a so basically maybe I want to do something like this um, and, and pick out the middle square. So in, in closure, rather than doing this full implementation, I can do this thing called deconstruction. Um, you lose your pride in this community very quickly because somebody can always write it faster and better, right? So this is what my friend Stu Holloway came up with. This is just a deconstruction. Actually, he told me about deconstruction, and I, I came up with this, and he said, that's too verbose. <laughs> I said, oh, I get it, right? He said, that's too verbose. <laughs> I said, okay, help me. He did that. That's really cool, right? This says, ignore the first row. Take that second thing, whatever it is. I don't care about anything after that. Take the second row. Um, and I don't care about the first character. I want the second character. And then close it out, return C, right? That's really cool. So this is just a tiny example of how, of how you can quickly transform things in closure. Um, like argument lists are something that we, we transform in Java and Ruby and, and Python all the time. And it, it's, it's trivial in, in a language with, that's, that's kind of built that way. So my, my perspective is that Clojure and Java really, really need each other. Colonel Jessup needs a night on the town and needs a, needs a dose of fun, right? He, he, he can't handle life, right? Um, the Java platform needs an update. It needs a, a dose of excitement and a dose of fun. Closure can really provide that. And Yoda's in exile, right? So the Java community represents a chance to get out of exile with a problem that the Java community desperately needs to solve. That we have built, we are built on the wrong programming paradigm for the solutions of, of the next 20 years or so that must be, um, must handle concurrency and they must do it much more elegantly than we do today. <laughs> okay, I wanna save a lot of time for questions because a whole lot of this is about um, the, the process of, of learning. Um, to write the book, I actually knew two of the languages well and I had um, a little, little bit of, of knowledge on the third. So you, are there any questions? Oh, by the way, I have a little bit of extra time, I think 10 extra minutes. Um, so. Yeah, let's say that I don't have the time or inclination to learn all of these languages. Yes. What are maybe the, the three or four that I could learn that would really expose me to some new idea that maybe I hadn't considered before? OK, so if I had to pick, if I had to distill it to three, well, um, let's, let's do elimination. Okay, um, do you want it, you want practical or do you want to expand your mind? Expand my mind. Okay, so um, let's probably scratch, are you an object-oriented programmer? Not so much, but from time to time. Okay, so what do you do today? Pro. You do Pro, okay, so procedural. Um, and some object-oriented. So I might, I might pick, pick up programming paradigms, right? And so there are four in the book. One is constraint-based logic programming, which is prologue. I would definitely include that in the list. Um, that will either expand your mind or blow it. Okay. <laughs> um, I would pick the prototype language because um, you know, if, if you're going to pick paradigms across these, um, you could either pick the object-oriented paradigm or the, um, the prototype paradigm. I believe the prototype paradigm is, um, is more powerful. And, and I actually believe it's, it's a better model for the next generation of, of problems that we need to solve. And so now we have to pick across Scala. And let's, let's eliminate Scala because it's, it's a bridge language and, and it'd be better to learn something um, pure. And then you could either do Clojure, which is really cool for its concurrency techniques, um, Erlang because of its fault tolerance and let it crash. But I would probably pick um, Haskell because Haskell is going to you know, take you into some uncharted territory. 
you'll have to deal with some of the true functional problems, right? So in a functional language, when you call a function, the answer always has to be the same. If you call it 10 times in a row, it, it, the answer and the side effects have to be exactly the same, right? So no side effects is, is a big time problem for, for those of us that started with procedural programming. So that's my three. So do you agree, Dan? 100%. Yeah. I think, yeah, so Prolog, IO, and Haskell, that's the way I'm More questions? I think it's a typo on that slide. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> They're paying attention. They really like me. Uh, more questions. You have to have questions about, um, yep. Uh, so Scala is a bridge language, and I, I agree. Yes. Uh, a bridge to what? So we don't know what that is. <laughs> what do you think it'll have? That's actually a very good question. Um, so I think that we are going in a functional direction, and I think that's been clear for a little while now. Um, the the <laughs> The people that have jumped out of, of the Java community have, have all come to more functional um, languages. I mean, even Ruby um, and, and Python have, have um, you know, expanded um, with, with you know, functional concepts. Um, so it's going to be functional. But what is the concurrency paradigm? I don't know. So we had three big ones in this talk, and, and we didn't really talk about um, we didn't talk about the third, which is closure, but there's an actor-based model. And then there's the Erlang-based model, which really um, is also actor-based, but it also leans hard on the JVM and the let it crash philosophy. And um, it's one of the languages that has a strong opinion about the virtual machine, even though the, there are, are Erlang implementations in other places. They're weaker, they're not as scalable, and they're not as complete. Um, and then there is the, um, the closure philosophy of, of um, of concurrency, which is I'm going to treat the um, variables or, or really like slots in memory, just like I treat rows in a database. And so, um, you know, there are concurrency models, multiple concurrency models, but Closure um, Closure picks one of those concurrency models to um, to handle. Um, I mean, you you literally start a transaction, you know, change memory, and then end your transaction whenever you want to do something with mutable state. And if you don't. Um, closure is going to complain at you, and that's that's a that's a beautiful model. If if you want, if 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 you want to deal with with mutability, which you have to, if you're dealing with um, with Java, um, one second, if if you're dealing with with Java applications, and then there's a, a another concurrency model, which is, if you don't have any side effects, you don't have any mutability, concurrency is not a problem. And that's the Haskell model. That's the pure, pure functional model. So there are four concurrency models. And we don't know which, which one of those is, is going to win. Dan. I was just going to point out that Clojure, Clojure has more concurrency functionality than just the STM. I mean, that's yes. like one tool. There are four, right? So there are the agents. He, um, and, and I go through um, three of the four in the book. Okay, yeah. So, um, so yeah. It, so, yeah, Clojure is, um, I think it's, it's, it's a brilliant, has, has a lot of brilliant metaphors in it. I think that um, Rich Hickey is another guy who had just tremendous taste in languages, right? Um, he didn't take anything sacred, right? So when you can say, um, hey, list, list guys, um, tail recursion, not such a big, not such a, um, not so important. You know, he's, he's, he's not afraid of that opinion, so, yep. Um, you, you're talking about closure and the JVM. What about the language like Ruby? So, I mean, I, I think that there's, there, there are a couple of questions embedded there. Is, is Ruby on the JVM a great thing? Yes. And, and it's a great thing from the perspective of it has, it has the chance to be more performant. And they're looking at the performance in the right ways, right, with, with hotspot compiling and just-in-time compiling based on the behavior of an application, not based on the type structure, which is, which is great research. Um, so, but there's also a, a major problem in Ruby. You know, if, if mutability is a bad thing, and in Ruby, the, the types, the classes are mutable and are frequently changed and touched, what do you do with that? I mean, what, what do you do with that? I don't know. I don't know. So I think that, um, that Ruby is going to remain a good language for expressing big ideas. Um, 
but, but you know, I, I think that there's an end game. I guess what I'm saying is I think that there's an end game for object-oriented languages. I think that we basically picked the wrong model. It was enough for, for 20 years. And I think that we're running out of gas with that programming paradigm. So when does that happen? In, in five or 10 years? Or is it sooner? I don't know. I don't know. But that's, that's kind of, when I get nervous, when my spidey sense starts tingling, I, I, I tend to you know, disappear and research and write a book. And, and that's, that's one of the things that you're seeing here. Yeah? Do we also lose the maker of design by that? What's that? Okay, so the question is, do we also lose domain-driven design? Um, that's something that I never, um, I never, um, so if you're talking about the concept of, of, um, of like a model layer and dining, designing your domain. Um, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, that's, that's another one that you have to answer I don't know to. And, and the reason is that some of these object-oriented languages, um, the program styles might be very similar to something that you be that you see in say Erlang, but not necessarily similar to something that you you'd see in like Haskell, right? The the meta model might be entirely different. And also, I, I don't think that we're done with bridge languages. I think that we're going to see a bridge language that's based more on a prototype based model um, that has a better chance of of integrating functional strong functional concepts and and you know. Some of the things that the I.O. Um, really got on down the road to getting right, like, like having immutable types and, and explicit conversions from immutable types. So um, sorry to punt on your, your question, but yeah. Yeah? I'm wondering if you played around with Scala to edit all. Um, it, feels like, it feels like to me that Scala has a bridge language anywhere. It's a bridge to Haskell. Um, and Scala to edit is kind of the utilization of that. I, I would say is, is that such a bad thing, but um, you know, I, I think that Haskell, um, Haskell has a very, very steep learning curve. And the reason that the learning curve is so steep is that we have to, to unlearn the old way of doing things. Um, if, if, um, I know that when people learn to code Lisp as freshmen, their minds don't get smaller and then have to be made bigger again. Um, MIT used this approach for a while, um, and, and some other universities did as well. Um, so I think that that's part of what we're of, of, of the problem that we're seeing um, with the adoption of functional languages is that we don't understand um, organization, programming organization the way that we need to for um, for functional programs, and, and I don't know what to do with that. Yeah. Uh, uh, OCaml? OCaml. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, so I, th that's, it's funny that you mentioned OCaml. Um, so Dave Thomas um, was, was the guy who, who probably got me into Ruby in the first place. And I asked him what languages that, um, that I should be looking at to kind of broaden my horizons. I did this like um, you know, three or four years ago when I was doing a, um, an article series for Java developers on IBM Developer Works. It was called Crossing Borders. And um, you know, that was one of the languages that I looked at. And if I do a sequel to this book, um, it's a lot of work. And, and um, you, know, you take off a lot of people, you know, even without a lot of opinions in the book. And I, I'm tend, I tend to be over-opinionated. But um, if I do another book, OCaml is, is probably going to be um, one of the languages included. That's another, that's, that's another of those bridge languages that um, gets a lot of the typing model right. But he doesn't have to contend with the JVM as well as, as everything else, right? So it's, it's an easier problem in some ways to solve. Well, yeah? I, I can definitely recommend F sharp instead of Camel in terms of looking at something that is a little bit more modern, a little bit more polished, uh, does away with some of the crazy, the crazy object part of Camel and interacts with the .NET platform quite well. Well, it interacts with .NET platform in a very non-trivial way. So it's got some, <laughs> it's got some knives and bear traps. Yeah. Well, that's, that's actually why I didn't do um, F Sharp the first time. I wanted to do something that was cross-platform. Um, one of the things I wanted to punt on was installing, right? So I didn't want to, to, um, to, to, 
to attack a 200-page installation manual and a 150-page you know, programming book. So I said, hey, install it on your own. I'm not even going to touch that. If you ask on the author forums, um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to laugh at you. You know, I basically, I did everything that I could to get, to get myself out of the installation problem. And um, that's, that's probably one of the reasons that I wouldn't do F-sharp. Well, but really well mono, mono that's, that's, a, that's a good point. Mono, it's, it's been used to. Yeah. Um, any more questions? What time have we got? So we've got time for, for a couple more questions. Yeah. Did you look at any of the concatenative languages, let's say Factor, or something like that? Yes, 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 yes. So, um, so in, in, on my list, on, on the, um, gosh, on another page in the editor, um, I have object-oriented languages, and they're small talk and Python, ones that I didn't get to this time. I think maybe at most one object-oriented language, because that's kind of what people know. I also have prototype languages, and, and Lua and Self are on that list. Um, I have stack-based languages, um, you know, Factor, Forth, um, and um, PostScript, actually. And, um, and then there's multi-paradigm and functional languages. And functional languages, I, I hit most of the big ones, but I'd like to do like Oz because it has some cool stuff and concurrency, and maybe a few other ones as well. So I think that, um, that they're trying to beat you to the lunch line, so. Um, which is probably full, which is why I'm delaying a little bit. Any more questions? Thank you very much.